Good evening, communication or pursuant KRS chapter 61 notice about May 21st, 2021. We're up board for Monday, May 20th, p.m. We have virtual meeting streamed on. The link for this meeting is fcps.net slash virtual meeting. The purpose of this meeting is for the board to announce to our community the candidates forwarded to us for consideration by the screening committee. Please be advised in this state of proclaimed national emergency and under a similar declaration by the governor it is not currently feasible for the board to provide meeting room conditions in the face of COVID-19, a highly contagious virus that spreads between people who are in close contact with one another. Under these exceptional circumstances in which the Commonwealth of Kentucky is confronting a worldwide pandemic, while nevertheless needing to accomplish critical public business, pursuant to KRS 61.840, the Fayette County Public Schools Board of Education will not provide a primary physical location for public viewing and will proceed pursuant to KRS 61.826 with concessions outlined in the Attorney General's opinion, OAG 20-05. Thus, the public can access the meeting via the live stream, but cannot be physically present at the meeting. Before we announce the candidates, uh, we want to reiterate our gratitude and appreciation to the members of our screening committee. These members have devoted many hours uh, to get us to this point. And they are Mr. Tom Jones, the school board representative, Ms. Jennifer, Dr. Jennifer Bolander, the teacher representative, Jessica Heiler, the chair, a teacher representative, Keon Massey, classified representative, Matt Marsh, principal representative, and Talithia Rout, the parent representative. They apply their diverse perspectives and insights to navigate through a pool of qualified, talented applicants from across the country. They reviewed intently the feedback from community input sessions and surveys using the position profile to help guide them through their conversations with each other and with applicants. Our entire board team is grateful for their willingness to volunteer their time and talents to this important work. We've said from the beginning of this process that this is truly shared work and a shared effort. This is a difficult time for our community, not only coming out of a global pandemic but also the passing of Superintendent Falk, whose passion and drive were putting students first and recognizing that victories in the classroom were committed to continuing this work. And we are grateful to Dr. Helm for her steady and wise leadership during this difficult time. 
and we are entering an important phase where we want our community to be informed and engaged and we will be discussing ways that you can do that. Our board's charge to the screening committee was to bring the board three to five highly qualified candidates for consideration by our board and our community, guided by the position profile and community input. We are pleased to announce that the screening committee has forwarded us five highly qualified candidates, and we are excited to announce these candidates to our community in alphabetical order. Dr. Christopher Bernier, Dr. Melvin Brown, Ms. Angela Dominguez, Dr. Tawana Grover, and Dr. Demetrius Liggins. At this time, our board team will introduce you to these candidates with more information, again, in alphabetical order, beginning with Vice Chair Green. Hello. I lost my screen, so just one moment. All right, thank you all for your patience. Dr. Christopher Bernier serves as the Chief of Staff for the Clark County School District in Las Vegas, Nevada. As an executive cabinet member in the fifth largest school district in the U.S. since 2019, Dr. Bernier drives and ex executes the student-centered vision for over 310,000 students and 42,000 employees. Dr. Bernier serves as the chair of the Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity Committee for Goals and Objectives. He has achieved an over 10% increase in graduation rates, revitalized magnet programs, and created unique partnerships for college and career pathways for students. Previously, he oversaw 200,000 students as the Associate Superintendent of Orange County Public Schools in Orlando, Florida. His education career began in 1987 in Orange County the ninth largest school district in the nation, and included roles as high school and middle school principal, assistant principal, dean of students, history teacher, athletic director, and coach. Dr. Bernier earned his undergraduate degree in history and education from Lemoyne College in Syracuse, New York, a master's degree in educational leadership from Nova Southeastern, and his doctorate in educational leadership from the University of Central Florida. Thank you. Board Member Jones. I am very happy to introduce to you Dr. Melvin Brown, who is serving as a superintendent of Reynoldsburg City Schools, a district of about 7,300 students, 7,300 students in a metropolitan area just outside Columbus, Ohio. He has been there since 2017. Prior to his role as superintendent in Reynoldsburg, he was associate superintendent at Prince William County Public Schools in Virginia a district of about 89,000 students and a county population of about 400,000. While at Reynoldsburg, Dr. Brown worked diligently to address district inequities in high school programming, including advanced placement and college credit plus enrollment. In his 22 years of school administrative experience, he has served as a deputy superintendent and director of human resources in Cahuga Falls City Schools, He's been a regional vice president for an education company and has served uh, several years of service as an elementary and high school principal, a coach, a supervisor of multicultural education, as well as a teacher. Dr. Brown holds a doctorate of education in educational studies and educational administration from Ohio State University, a master's of arts in educational administration and supervision from Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, and a Bachelor's of Arts in English from James Madison University in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Board Member Morris. Board Member Morris, I'm not Order. sure that we're going to be able to understand you. I think Mr. Mark may have to read it. I, okay. Uh, Angela Dominguez serves as the Assistant Superintendent of Academic Services in Edgewood Independent School District in San Antonio, Texas, a large urban district of about 10,000 students. Previously, she served as the district's Chief of Secondary Schools and Executive Director of School Leadership. Ms. Dominguez is making great strides in providing equitable opportunities for scholars of Edgewood, a high poverty district. 
Accomplishments across her 26-year career include collaboration with external partners such as Texas A&M, the Texas Council for International Studies, and others to create unique learning opportunities for Edgewood students, improved academic accountability from a D grade to a C, selection as a principal of the year semifinalist by a Texas-based corporation, and recognition as the bilingual administrator of the year by a local chapter of bilingual educators. She attained her Bachelor of Arts in History from Dartmouth College and her Master of Science in Educational Administration from Texas A&M University, Kingsville. She is currently in the Cooperative Superintendency Program at the University of Texas at Austin, where she is in the research phase of her dissertation on how to retain high quality principals in high poverty urban schools. Our next candidate is Dr. Kamana Grover. Dr. Grover is a superintendent of Grand Island Public Schools in Grand Island, Nebraska a district of over 10,000 students. Prior to becoming a superintendent in 2016, she served leadership roles in DeSoto Independent Schools, a suburban district of Dallas, Texas with 10,000 students as chief human resource officer, executive director of federal programs, director of special programs and principal. Dr. Grover championed equity work within the Grand Island Public School District to accelerate her mission of creating a level playing field for every student and launched the district's inaugural strategic plan. Her work led to the development of a district equity value statement, a resolution on eliminating racism that was adopted by the Board of Education and the formation of a district equity framework. She increased student achievement in 75% of needs improvement schools and increased the number of students scoring 20 or above on the ACT by 5.4% within two years. Dr. Grover earned a PhD in special education from the University of North Texas and at S in educational leadership from Doan University and one in elementary educational leadership from Auburn University, Montgomery, and MS and BS in elementary education, both from Auburn University, Montgomery. Board member Spires. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Demetrius Liggins. Dr. Demetrius Liggins has served since 2016 as a superintendent of schools in Greenville Independent School District, an urban district of 5,000 students outside of Dallas, Texas. Previously, Dr. Liggins has been a bilingual Spanish classroom teacher, an assistant principal, an elementary, middle, and high school principal, and an area superintendent of schools and a district with as many as 35,000 students. In his current role, Dr. Liggins has increased student outcomes at all levels, including minority and economically disadvantaged students' performance, led the creation of a five-year strategic plan and graduate profile, and has transitioned several traditional schools to schools of choice, which helped improve equity across the district. He was named an inspiring leader by the Texas Association of School Administrators and was among the first to compete complete the American Association of School Administrators National Superintendent Certification. He earned the Distinguished Leadership Award from Texas A&M University in Commerce, Texas. Association, oh, excuse me. Dr. Liggins received his bachelor's in education and master's degree in English from California State University, Fresno, and a master's of education and superintendent certification from Stephen F. Austin State University. He received his PhD in K through 16 educational leadership and policy from the University of Texas, Arlington. Thank you, board members. And we look forward to joining our community and getting to know our candidates more over the next couple of weeks. And speaking of getting to know our candidates at this time, I'm gonna ask Vice Chair Green to let us know how the community can continue to engage and partner with us in this process and get to know these highly qualified candidates a little bit better. Thank you, Chair Murphy. I just wanna share our sincere gratitude and appreciation to this phenomenal community for your generous gifts of your time, your unique perspectives and your valuable insights throughout our process of finding our next superintendent. First, let me take a moment to remind everyone how, how you have already directly impacted this process. We have heard from students, teachers, administrators, parents, post-secondary institutions, faith-based organizations, members of our esteemed business community, nonprofit organizations, advocacy, service, and special interest groups, and members of our local government agencies. So how did we hear from you? With 42 individual and small group input sessions, with four public input sessions, 
with 28 do-it-yourself input sessions. So that's 74 sessions of learning and listening. Might I also remind us, we did this during a global pandemic. Our community pivoted, persevered, and came together to contribute to this important process. But that's not all. We also had over 5,000 responses to our online survey as well. So the data was gathered from the sessions in the survey to help inform with the development of the position profile, the application screening process, and the development of the interview and reference questions. Using the values and perspectives shared by our community as the measure, the screening committee assessed the candidates against the minimum qualifications, the preferred qualifications, and the over 20 interpersonal and professional competencies as they reviewed candidates' applications, listened to can candidates' responses to questions during interviews, and heard referencing from supervisors, peers, and direct reports who have worked directly with their candidates. Based on all of this information, the screening committee has brought forth their top five highly qualified candidates. So now you may be asking yourself, how does the community continue to be involved? The goal is to continue to create opportunities for all stakeholders to share in this next step, getting to know our candidates and share your valuable input. This involvement will help ensure that we work together to set our new superintendent up for success. So let me share the following ways that you can participate. The first one I'm so excited about. Tomorrow on Tuesday, our very own Fayette County Public School students are going to conduct introduction interviews with each candidate. Once these interviews are finalized, they will be shared on our website, scps.net slash search. Please take a look at these interviews to get to know our candidates just a little bit better and see them interact with our students. Secondly, everyone, including students, parents, employees, all community members and community leaders are invited to join each candidate for a community forum. These will be held on Wednesday of this week, the 26th, and Thursday, the 27th, and they will go as follows. On Wednesday, from 5.30 to 6.30, you can meet with Dr. Tawana Grover. Wednesday, 6.45 to 7.45, you meet with Dr. Demetrius Liggins. Thursday, 4.30 to 5.30, Ms. Angela Dominguez. Thursday, 5.45 to 6.45, Dr. Melvin Brown. And Thursday, 7 to 8, Dr. Christopher Bernier. These forums will be a unique opportunity to hear directly from the candidates on topics of highest importance to you. There are three ways you can engage to participate in these community forums. The first way, submit your questions ahead of time. If you are like many of the many community members who have already reached out to us, you may already have your questions and topics ready to go, which is fantastic. So please go ahead and submit them at fcps.net slash search. The second way to participate is you can submit questions live virtually during the forum. We will be streaming the forum live and accepting questions in real time from those watching online. And the third way to participate is you can ask questions in person. While our candidates will be joining us virtually through Zoom, members of the public, public may view and participate in forums in person at the Norsworthy Auditorium at 701 East Main Street. Our moderator will take questions from those in the audience. So if you're already ready, you send them on in. You can watch it live, send those questions in, or you can be there in person and ask your questions. We are so grateful for Dia Davidson from WLEX18 for moderating. She will try to cover as many questions and topics as time allows. But that's not all. So finally, we are excited to share that our community will have an opportunity to meet each of our candidates in person during a special community meet and greet. So grab your masks and mark your calendars for Wednesday, June 2nd, 7 to 8.30 p.m. at Frederick Douglass High School. So, once you've had the opportunity to see our candidates interact directly with our students to, with those interviews, participate in the community forum, we need to hear from you. So please share your unique perspectives and insights with us at fcpnet slash search by the end of this week. Each board member will have read-only access to every single comment provided. We also plan to solicit additional feedback following those in-person meet and greets on June 2nd. Your thoughts are so important to us and vital as we work together to find the best superintendent for our schools and our community. And remember, at any time in this process, you are welcome to email the board members directly. You can send us individual messages or you can send one message that reaches all of us at feedback at fayette.kyschools.us. Lexington is an exquisitely intricate tapestry woven together by the unique threads of each and every lived experience of our diverse community. Each member of our community is a gift to the collective whole from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you.
Thank you, Vice Chair Green. Thank you, board members. And as Vice Chair Green said, the next few weeks are critically important and for our district and for our community. And as uh, board member Green noted, we want to hear from you. We want you to meet all of these candidates, both virtually and in person. And we want you to share your feedback with us. Our board team will be reviewing candidate references, noting candidate interactions with our community and preparing for in-person interviews next week and reviewing your feedback. So please make note of the dates that were mentioned, the 26th and 27th for the community forums, and then June 2nd for the meet and greet. Uh, these will also be shared on the search site at fcps.net slash search. We look forward to extending a Fayette County welcome to all of these talented candidates. And at this time, I will entertain a motion to adjourn, noting that we will reconvene at 6 p.m. for our regular monthly meeting. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. A motion by board member Spires. Is there a second? Second. A motion by board member Green. We have a motion, a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you all.
You can go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I will now call this special regular meeting of the Fayette County Board of Education to order. Pursuant to KRS Chapter 61, notice is hereby given that on May 21st, 2021, the chair of the Fayette County Board of Education called a special meeting of the Board of Education for Monday, May 24th, 2021 at 6 p.m. The Fayette County Public School Board of Education will conduct a virtual meeting on Mo Monday, May 24th, 2021 at 6 p.m. This will be a virtual meeting streamed online. The link for this meeting is fcps.net slash virtual meeting. This is the board's monthly regular meeting, but is specially called because it will be conducted virtually. Please be advised in the state of a proclaimed national emergency and under a similar declaration by the governor, it is not currently feasible for the board to provide meeting room conditions in the face of COVID-19, a highly contagious virus that spreads between people who are in close contact with one another within about six feet. Under these exceptional circumstances in which the Commonwealth of Kentucky, Kentucky is confronting a worldwide pandemic while nevertheless needing to accomplish critical public business pursuant to KRS 61.840, the Fayette County Public Schools Board of Education will not provide a phys primary physical location for public viewing and will proceed pursuant to KRS 61.826 with concessions outlined in the Attorney General's Opinion OAG 20-05. Thus, the public can attend the media via the live stream, but cannot be physically present at the meeting. Ms. Daly, will you please take roll call? Good evening. Ms. Amy Green? Present. Mr. Tom Jones? Present. Ms. Christy Morris? And she just dropped off. Would you I like me to proceed? Yeah, we can proceed. We don't have to wait anymore when people drop off, but I know she's having internet trouble and so she's trying to connect and get in. So hopefully she can join us here in a few minutes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Tyler Murphy. Ms. Stephanie Spires. Present. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Daly. I'd like to begin by welcoming everyone who is watching online this evening. We will begin our meeting with the reading of our mission statement by Fayette County Board of Education member Stephanie Spires. And I apologize. I don't have that right in front of me because I have too many screens pulled up from our last. So give me just a second. We could all read it together. Let's try that. Let's, let's all read it together. The mission of the Fayette County Schools is to create a collaborative community that ensures that all students achieve at high levels and graduate prepared to excel in a global society. Thank you, Dr. Helm. Thank you, mm -hmm. Board Member Spires. I now have to find my screen as well. <laughs> Next, I will accept a motion to adopt the agenda for tonight's meetings with any changes voiced, including the lifting of items from the consent section for discussion. Is there such a motion? So moved. Thanks. Heard a motion. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Board Member Jones. It was a first um, move by um, Ms. Uh, Board Member Spire, seconded by Board Member Jones. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries 3-0. Each month, we have a teacher, student, and classified employee representative at our meetings. It is my honor tonight to introduce our teacher representative, Ms. Amy Graham. Amy is a native, is a Lexington native who attended Mill Creek Elementary, Taste Creek Middle School, and Taste Creek High School. 
Five years ago, she landed back on her beloved Taste Creek campus as a middle school social studies teacher and is elated to continue carrying the Commodore banner for many years to come. Her two sons, Charlie and Noah, attend Taste Creek Elementary School. Amy lives in Lexington with her husband, sons, and cats. Thank you, Amy. Our student representative for the month of May is Ruby Sherrard, who recently graduated from the Engineering Academy and Spanish Immersion Program at the Academies of Bryan Station High School. She has been an engineering student ambassador for three years and her career pathway is medical or mechanical engineering. Ruby has also been an important contributing member to the VEX Robotics team, along with serving as the president of Technology Student Association. She has also been involved in station arts, specifically orchestra and theater. Additionally, Ruby is a student athlete and member of the women's golf team. In the fall of 2021, she will be attending the University of Alabama in Huntsville to pursue her interest in aerospace engineering. And board member Green, I believe that Ruby is working this evening and is not able to join us unless she is joining us late. So just wanted to mention if we don't see her, that's where she is. She's already out there um, make, making waves. Thank you. And our classified employee representative is Chandra Balu Barnes, a native of Lexington who graduated from Bryan Station High School and the University of Kentucky, where she earned a bachelor's degree in individual and family development and a master's degree in vocational education. She began her career with SCPS at Crawford Middle School as a Family Resource Youth Service Center assistant. Currently, she is the Family Resource Center Director, Director at Breckenridge Elementary. In the past, Sandra has served Lexington by working in the community as a get on board graduate, Lexington Urban League Young Professional and Junior League of Lexington. Currently, she is serving as board member of the following, Safe Kids, Safe Kids Coalition, Coalition Membership and Education Committee, the Woodhill Community Center International Market League Volunteer, SCESPA at large board member, Region 10 Frisk Advisory Council, Chris Kentucky Coalition Historian and the Toy Chest. While she is not serving her community, Sandra enjoys being outdoors, working in her garden and traveling. Sandra could not give of herself without the support of her family, Vicki and Tim Mitchell, her sister and brother-in-law, Vicki and Tim Mitchell, her sister and brother-in-law, Lauren Mitchell, her niece, and Darren Barnes, her loving and supportive, hus supportive husband of 26 years. Please join me in welcoming our three or two that are here, but third in spirit, distinguished school board um, representatives. We are glad to have you with us this month and we encourage you to participate in our discussions and speak up and ask any questions or make any points you have throughout the meeting. At this time, I will turn the agenda over to Acting Superintendent Marlene Hell for the superintendent's report. Uh, thank you, uh, board member Green and the um, I want to extend and add my own welcome to the members of the public who are joining us for tonight's virtual meeting. Uh, I will say that we are very close, I hope, to uh, returning to in-person uh, meetings. We are working very diligently on the space uh, in our new building at 450 Park Place, and hopefully uh, over the next month, we will have everything set up so that we can uh, return with, with safety precautions and health precautions so that we can uh, begin our uh, in-person meetings again. So I would also like to welcome our representatives uh, this evening, uh, Amy, Ruby, and Sandra. We certainly understand about Ruby uh, working and, and just congratulate her on, on her graduation and wish her well as she pursues her, um, her life dreams. So I want to give you just a real brief update uh, on the, C the work of the CCT. Um, let me just start by saying how proud uh, I am, and I think we are, of our community, our community at large, our school community, our students, our parents, our um, employees, because we did not get the opportunity to return to in-person uh, to return in person, those students whose families so chose that without the input and the work and the commitment of a lot of people. So let me just remind you of some high notes. Um, we have 42,000 students 
in our school district, 42,000 students. 40,000 Chromebooks were provided to those students. 40,000 Chromebooks that we are now collecting and cleaning and repairing so that they're ready for next year and purchasing new ones uh, because we realize that uh, we're using them uh, very strenuously. We provided over 2,500 hotspots. Our staff made over 36,000 home visits during that, during that time. We provided over 3 million meals to families, um, to students. Um, we provided 48,000, over 48,000 mental health support contacts, whether it was calling, whether it was visiting, whether it was uh, suggesting some material. We also did our own health clinics. We did 13 health clinics because we did them at uh, each of our, our six high schools. We uh, had one at uh, STEAM Academy and we provided over 3,000 plus shots in the arm, arms. Um, we were so excited about our uh, vaccine clinics. We were able to offer uh, second dose shots at all six of our high schools just last Tuesday, the last day of school. So imagine at our high schools, they were trying to uh, do um, vaccine clinics in the school year and also do graduation rehearsals. So our high schools were jumping, as they say, last Tuesday. And at one high school, it was really jumping because we had the honor of welcoming the governor, Governor Andy Bashir, and Mayor Linda Gorton to uh, Lafayette High School, where they actually gave recognition to uh, the students. And, and Governor Bashir even talked about the fact that you know, students were recognizing that these shots in the arms were very, very important and were taking the lead and that we should never um, underestimate the power of students coming together and really, you know, making their mind up. And we actually got to see students uh, getting their shots. We had a mom there who was explaining why she was supportive of her 12-year-old uh, uh, because 12 year olds have also been uh, approved for the shots. And it was just very, very exciting. So we certainly want to thank the governor, the mayor and Wild Health. And of course our partners at our own Lexington Fayette Health Department. And I would be remiss if I did not take a moment to just tell you again, how wonderful the uh, COVID core team or the CCT as we call them, uh, what I will remind you is that we held over 50 meetings between December and May, and we continue to meet. Um, we know that out in our schools, teachers and principals were making a number of plans over this past year. They, they did a hybrid plan, a remote plan, an in-person plan, a targeted assistance plan. Uh, we had VLA, um, there, were, there was a lot of effort and a lot of work, a lot of creativity, a lot of dedication. And so I certainly want to thank all of our employees. I especially want to thank CCT because 50 meetings and over 160 plus hours uh, of meetings and working together. We want to thank especially our Dr. Humbaugh and Dr. Winner of the uh, health department for being our our guide along, alongside us as we worked through this uh, was very, very important. On the last day of school, I will tell you that the highlight, uh, in addition to being with the governor and the mayor, that's always a highlight, but I had the opportunity to go to Wellington Elementary, where three schools, Wellington, Maxwell, and Glendover, uh, the fifth grade classes uh, in those three schools, specifically uh, led by fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Deppenbrock at Wellington, they um, wrote a book called The Pandemic Press, and it's called Kids Perspectives. I don't know if you can see, but it's called Kids Perspectives of the Pandemic. We are ordering a copy for each member of the board, and I promised both the mayor and the governor I would send them a copy as well. The book is not only written by the students and the teachers, but also illustrated. And when you read the book, um, you will be so touched by how focused these students were and how, how, how deeply 
the pandemic and being out of school for almost a year really touched them. Um, you'll enjoy reading uh, some of their stories about uh, how they, you know, got much more familiar with their pets than they ever thought that they would, how some of them learned to cook, um, the lessons that they learned, how, you know, they, they learned that they had to be so much more organized. They had to be responsible because in many homes, not only was school going on with parents stepping up to become teachers, um, teachers also realized that they were teaching whole families. And so, because they were actually in their living rooms, students also, you know, talked about, uh, one student talked about the many ways he learned not to be bored. And uh, so when you read it, um, you'll get not only a historic perspective of the pandemic year, but also come to appreciate how much our students learned during that year. So we've heard a lot of talk about learning loss. You know, I think students learned a lot of things. It may not have been what we had intentionally laid out for the year, but students were not sitting home, not learning. They definitely did learn. And so hopefully you will enjoy the, um, the pandemic press kids perspective when you get your copy and treasure it as I have already uh, grown uh, to treasure it. So with that in mind, that is our report for CCT. We will be meeting over the summer to guide our summer school and also to make sure that we are prepared for the upcoming school year. We will be providing the schools with uh, some documents and some guidance on you know, what's in, what's out. We've had lots of questions about whether they can take up the six foot uh, you know, distancing uh, uh, arrows and footprints in the hallways and can they do away with the, the thermometers and other kinds of PPE that we provided and we'll be giving them guidance uh, over the summer so that uh, they will be ready when school begins again in full in August. So at this time uh, I would like to ask uh, Chief Operating Officer Myron Thompson to present the monthly construction report and I'll turn it over to Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Dr. Helm. Our security festival at the Carter G. Woodson Primary Academy has moved into the demolition, uh, demolition phase, and we will be starting construction shortly thereafter, and we'll turn that building over to the program director in July. Uh, the new Tates Creek High School facility is roughly uh, at 45% completion, and we will be opening that building July of 2022. In the last month, we've had concrete slab work, uh, CMU walls, and hollow metal frame Installation continued. The electrical and plumbing rub ins continued uh, in the masonry walls and piping and ductwork installation continued as well. There was a structural steel work uh, that occurred in area B second level. We bricked the dugouts and backstop walls at the baseball and softball fields. The mechanical installation continued as did the metal wall panels and ceiling grid and paint at the field house and our geothermal, geothermal lateral piping work uh, in the Wellfield A on the northwest side of the property continued through the month of May. Uh, through this month also, we have uh, begun our still roof joist in areas F and continued roof joist in area E. Uh, we've had walls occurring in area D main level and the area B third level. Uh, we've had roofing and air, air barrier work uh, continued in area A. Uh, walls are continuing in area C and area B third level and areas E and F of the main level. Uh, we've continued with plumbing, electrical rough ends and above ceiling duct work and piping uh, are progressing as does the dugouts and box stop walls and earthwork and uh, grading at the baseball and softball fields. Overall, we've had uh, good weather and the contractor continues to make excellent progress on the project. We're uh, halfway there. And as always, there's more information that can be found on our webpage at uh, fcps.net tchs construction. And I think we have a couple of slides, Amy, that maybe you could throw up for a second just to give a visual uh, of the progress that is taking place. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, you can see the baseball field house and dugout are uh, essentially uh, almost done. So again, very excited. And uh, that concludes my update. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Uh, that concludes the superintendent's report. So at this time, I will turn it back over to board member Green. And Chair Murphy is in the room. So if it's okay with you, I will turn it over to you. Okay. <laughs> You were doing a fine job. Thank, um, thank you. you. 
Uh, we are uh, next on our agenda is time for remarks by citizens. Fayette County Board of Education Policy states 01.45 states members of the public may address the board during the period set aside by the board without submitting an item for the agenda. No action shall be taken during this portion of the meeting on issues raised by employees of the public unless deemed an emergency by the board. Please be mindful that this is a public broadcast. Speakers may be muted or removed from the meeting for profane or obscene language or other behavior that's not appropriate for a public meeting. Speakers will not be allowed to make any disparaging or critical remarks about individuals or employees of the district. Critical comments or complaints are processed through the district's complaint procedures, which afford the individuals to whom comments or complaints are directed the opportunity for response and due process. If disparaging or critical remarks about individuals are made, speakers will immediately be muted and removed from the meeting. At this time, members of the public who have signed up prior to the meeting are invited to speak. This is not intended to be a time for debate, but the board will take the public's input into consideration. The time allotted each speaker will be three minutes. We have instituted a process to allow members of the public to sign up to speak in advance of the meeting, similar to that used by the Lexington Bay Urban County Council. Details on that process are available at fcps.net slash public comment. Tonight, we have five people who have signed up to speak. I will ask each of them to keep their remarks to less than three minutes, and Ms. Chatfield will be our official timekeeper. Uh, he'll be giving you verbal cues. And our first speaker is Melody Robinson. Hi, everyone. I'm Melody Robinson. I'm a student at Henry Clay High School, and I've lived in Lexington for my entire life and have been in Fayette County Public Schools for my entire school career. Per an open records request, the district will spend $7 million on school police this year, millions more than the spending on student and mental health support combined. This comparison in funding is not a new thing and has been deeply prevalent since the 10-point safety plan and, and has enlisted there to be five cops in every high school. The unjust and racist treatment we see from police outside of schools does not disappear on school grounds. Black students are only 23% of the population, but have 92% of school charges placed on them. My brother, who has ADHD, experienced intense and radical policing inside of FCPS by the police force, which led him to drop out. He first began to experience this policing in eighth grade, and my brother is not alone. Being a student at Henry Clay, I walk the halls and see numbers of armed officers as if we are prison, and they make me afraid. Constantly fearing for myself and my classmates has become a norm, and I am not alone in this. Having police in schools makes us feel like we are in prison, and the people that they put in prison are mostly deemed the troublemakers or the bad kids. These kids, which are not numbers, they are real people, just like my brother, are just kids. They're being deemed bad because of simple behaviors and they don't deserve to be pushed into jail cells. And the students are disproportionately black or disabled. It doesn't have to be this way. Cops are not trained to be social workers or counselors. They're not trained to help students. They're trained to arrest and help with detaining violent criminals. Children are not violent criminals. As well as this, the idea that cops stop school shootings is contrary to research. Having a trusted adult inside schools has proven to lower the likelihood of school attacks. We all saw in Parkland when the SRO left 17 people to die. I'm not digging on the people and representatives who have created the 10-point safety plan because it was made to try and keep children safe. But the effects of having this huge number of cops in schools and spending so many tax dollars on cops has not made us safe. I have friends who have said that they feel more comfortable and safe at home than they do at school with police officers. I'm asking more than to just be listened to. I'm asking you all as a school board fighting for my student safety and support to reevaluate the 10-point safety plan and make it a priority. I'm asking you to hear me and the real statistics proving that racist, punitive, and sometimes violent policing does not belong in schools. We must create an environment where every student feels secure in school and not in fear of being brutalized in a place that they're supposed to feel safest. We deserve real mental health support specialists and student support now. To do this, we must make change. That's why we have I'm three seconds remaining. Thank you. That's why I'm calling on the district to reduce the number of police, restrict the role they police in our schools, and reinvest in mental health and student support services. Thank you for your time. I'm done. Thank you, Melody. Our next speaker is Barry Saturday. FCPS family, my name is Barry Saturday, and I'm the proud father of two young children in Fayette County Schools. Are you able to hear me? Great. Yes. 
I also previously served as an FCPS social studies Who's teacher. This family. My name is Barry Saturday, and I'm the proud father. Mr. Saturday, you're getting uh, some feedback. I fixed it. Schools like society are solving more and more of our problems with police instead of common sense. Kids make mistakes. Kids do dumb things. We all know this, and as adults, we should know that growing up is a challenge for those of us from the best of circumstances. So why are we incarcerating kids who grew up less fortunate? In my view, all kids make mistakes. Indeed, the Christian view is that all people make mistakes. And sometimes those mistakes are the particular results of how we all are raised. Is it any wonder that kids raised in negative, neglectful environments turn to gangs for a family or to drugs and alcohol for an escape from their lives? It's easy to throw these kids into a dark hole for these mistakes when it is often parents in society that are failing them. For us Christians, we're absolving ourselves of the call to heal others, and we're unwilling to admit it has become easier and more expedient to destroy lives of young people who make different mistakes than we do than to look at these people as brothers and sisters who need help. Think of how our world would be different today if we still held these values. I taught in the Fayette County Schools and saw many situations where kids made mistakes. I recently wrote an op-ed in the Herald Leader as well, supporting this cause, the Counselors Over Cops, because I believe in it, and shared a personal story with the community. One day, a kid had done something fairly gross to my lunch, and the police wanted to make it a crime. The kid had put my food in his mouth and then back on my tray when I wasn't looking. The school police told me he could have had diseases and intend to harm me, which is extremely unreal. <coughs> Excuse me extremely unrealistic, but in my momentary shock, the event was designed to make me think the kids' actions were far more heinous than the disgusting prank that it was. Suggesting the worst possible scenario is a common component of law enforcement's pattern and practice that sows fear amongst our community and implements a pipeline to prison. So how do we implement a better whole child educational system? Over the past 60 years, our society has weakened, and we have failed to build the supports needed to adapt to a changing educational environment. Currently, principals generally untrained in child psychology are responsible for addressing behavioral issues. Counselors spend the majority of their time supporting academic counseling rather than emotional wellness. Pardon me. Your time is rather, expired. Rather than more police, more counselors trained to support children who have Mr. Saturday, your time has expired. Oh, forgive me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Saturday. Our next speaker this evening is Stuart Waldner. Sir, your audio is still connecting, so the board cannot hear you. He's still connecting. And I'm not sure if he can hear us if he's not connected to audio yet. Turn him to the waiting room and we can move to the next one and see if he can connect at the end. Yes, yes that will be fine. Thank you. And that means uh, we will move on to uh, our next speaker, Benjamin Shapir. Mr. Shapir, you can go ahead if you'll unmute yourself. All right. Here's my comment. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Benjamin Shapir. This year, I'm graduating at Bryan Station High School. And while I'm in a celebratory mood, I worry for the kids who still have to go through high school for the next one to four years and deal with the anxiety every day that school cops instill in us. Walking into school each morning just to see a cop or multiple cops standing by the metal detectors or the entrance staring down at us really takes a toll. It's almost like they're saying to us with all their staring that this is our territory, we've seized it, and you are now subjected to our world, rule. And that they're watching us and that they don't trust us as all, at all and that they could arrest us or worse, given their multiple weapons at any time for any reason at all, and they would probably get away with it. In February, counselors of our cops asked FCPS students about their thoughts on school police, and one answer really stuck with me. And I quote, there is no need for SROs. School is supposed to be our second home. Cops aren't supposed to be in our home. Cops are not supposed to be in our homes. If we take this student's definition of our schools as a second home for students, why would we place in them an entity that we know from overwhelming evidence doesn't keep us safe? This is a question the school board must come to reckon with if they are to create a truly safe environment for students and an equitable one too. We need to value competent adults instead of cops who aren't trained to uh, keep kids safe. Thank you, Mr. Shapir. Do we have Mr. Waldner back? Can I bring him in again and try? Okay. It looks like he is connected. Mr. Waldner, can you hear us? Mr. Waldner, if you can hear, you can go ahead with your comment. I don't think he has a microphone connected. Mr. Chair, if you would like, I could call, reach out to Mr. Waldner via his phone. Okay, we will move on to the next speaker then in that okay. case while, while you're doing that. Okay. And uh, that means we will move on to Mr. Richard O'Neill. Now time keep. Thank you, Dr. Neal. Mr. O'Neill, you can begin. Hi, I'm Rick O'Neill, a uh, recent graduate from Bryan Station High School, which is the most diverse, poorest, and most police school in FCPS. I've walked past school resource officers empty-handed on several occasions, hearing them stop students of color just paces behind me for not having a hall pass. When my classmates see SROs wearing Blue Lives Matter masks, they understand that what's being said is that Black lives don't. The police force in my school is tone deaf at best and antagonistic at worst. Cops in our schools regularly profile black kids as troublemakers, which doesn't happen nearly as often with teachers and administrators, seeing as how staff actually interact with and get to know students personally. The bottom line is that police are trained to police. They're armed and their job is to deal with criminals. We're spending $7 million a year on people with hammers and my fellow students simply aren't nails. Our schools are being policed. My peers and I are being policed. SROs aren't here for our safety, they are a threat to our safety. Just last school year, 86% of FCPS student arrests and 92% of FCPS student charges were black students, while they only made up 23% of the student body. I promise you that black kids are no more criminal than white kids. The issue is a racist criminal justice system that hungers for more penal slave labor. Behavioral corrections in schools should be approached with understanding and empathy which just isn't happening when we spend millions more on school policing than we do on student support. In my times of mental health crisis, counselors, social workers, mental health professionals, and school psychologists were nowhere to be found. We need to prevent behavioral issues by providing much needed resources to students because punitive and sometimes violent police responses only exacerbate existing problems. On behalf of students still in FCPS, I'm demanding that we limit the number of SROs to one per school, that they not be involved in everyday classroom infractions and that we provide our students with the st support that they need and deserve. Lastly, I'd like to remind you that over 3,000 potential voters and political organizers just graduated alongside myself, and that the inaction of elected officials comes at a price. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. O'Neill. Uh, Ms. Chaffel, do we have Mr. Walden? 
I could not reach him. I left him a voicemail. We could try bringing him in one more time and see if it's corrected, if you'd like. We can try, yes. Ms. Johns, would you mind trying again? Mr. Walder, are you able to hear us? Something's not working. Yes, I figure it's not corrected. Shelly, why don't you continue to try to reach him, and then if we can get him, uh, perhaps the board would be willing to let him speak uh, later on in the meeting. Okay, I will do that. Yes. That can... Excellent. That will work. Thank you all. And I'm, I have the same issue that uh, I share green out earlier. I've lost my screen. Oh. <laughs> uh, let's see here. We go on to routine matters, I believe. Yes. There so we that's are. Minutes of the May 10th. Yeah. Session. Excellent. And, and in addition to these comments, too, I will note that we received written comments uh, from five members of the public Shane Morris, Bridget Payton, Rick Thompson, Katie Taylor, and Alexis. Uh, Gansha submitted comments. Their full submissions have been shared with board members and will be included in the board record, which is different than the board meeting minutes. And next on our agenda, as Dr. Helm indicated, is the approval of routine matters. So this time a motion is in order to approve the minutes of the May 10th, 2021 planning work session of the Fayette County Board of Education. Do I have a motion to that effect? Submit. Second. Uh, motion by Board member Green, a second by board member Spires. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All, any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Next, I'll entertain a motion to approve our consent agenda items. Is there a motion? I will make a motion to approve the consent agenda items. And I'll motion second. By, motion by board member Green, motion a second by board member Spires. Is there any discussion on the consent agenda? All in favor of approving this consent agenda, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. And at this time, I'll turn the agenda over to Superintendent uh, Dr. Helm to take us through the handful of action items we have this evening. Thank you. Um, the first item uh, this evening uh, that we'd like to first give you an update on the request that we've received uh, from families under uh, the Senate Bill 128. That was a, a new piece of legislation from this past legislative session, uh, sometimes known as the do-over or supplemental year program. You will recall that families had until May 1st to submit requests and the board has until June 1st, which is right around the corner, to approve all or none of the requests. That is the way the law uh, it's been stated that boards of education will either approve all of them or none. So um, if the board chooses to approve the request, then there is an assurance document that we will be asking you to approve and then we will be submitting all of that. I think that is due by June 16th. So here to give you an update on Senate Bill 128 is our Director of Pupil Personnel, Steve Hill and our Director of Budget and Financial Planning, uh, Ann Sampson Grimes. Good evening, board, and um, it's good to see everybody today. Uh, Ms. Amy Johns, can you go to the next screen? So today we're talking, you've seen this screen a couple of times. It just kind of gives a brief overview of what Bill, Senate Bill 128 was and the impact, and I won't read through it, but I will highlight a couple of things just for our community more than anything. Um, it's, it gave an opportunity for parents to request a supplement of the year or a, re, re, a redo year. Um, and part of the requirement from the legislation, Senate Bill 128, was that our board will vote on all or none, like Dr. Helm had said, by June 1st. So this is why it's before you today, May 24th. And tonight, the objective is to quickly show you the, the changing of the data as we even encountered some of our fam families and engage them on deeper conversations. And then we also have, in addition to this, uh, the, the state released assurances that the board will uh, vote on 
uh, and we will implement uh, as a district. So you'll see that as part of one of the slides and I'll quickly go through this because I know we have many items tonight. Uh, the next screen, please. Um, the, the data on the left of your screen is May 10th data, which is I, I shared with you uh, two weeks ago was 523 total requests for the district. After many conversations and, and boy, the timing of this was tough because our, our schools were trying to do K prep, wrap up the end of the school year graduation, their AP testing today. So um, this is where it was as of today, 412 students. So we have, we have you know, dropped a give or take uh, 111, I think it is, um, if I did the math correct, uh, students so far that parents have now gained more information and realized that they, they don't think that the, this was uh, the right fit for their, their child. So um, I, I believed back on May 10th, 523 over 70 some odd schools was a doable. It was dispersed pretty evenly, it was doable then. And, and I could, um, would say that 412 was even more uh, we can accommodate 412 um, of those students. I will tell you, we I just even right before had another email from another counselor. Hey, this child rescind this parents uh, rescinded their their child. So this data literally is changing and will continue to change. I would suspect we'll be down in the mid 350s by the time it's all said and done. Um, and remember, we do have summer ignite going on. We've got credit recovery going on. A lot of our families are, our, our kids are participating in that. Hopefully we'll be able to catch those up that have lagged behind. Um, any questions on that data before I go to the next screen? Mr. Uh, Mr. Hill, um, yes. how long do parents have to rescind? What is that timeline? Oh, just to yeah. remind everybody. We're, we're going to, we're going to, we, we would encourage, you know, depending on their situation, but we're, we're really trying to get this information done before it would be ideal by the end of June, but there will be uh, to draw a hard line in the sand. There may be scenarios where we need to, where they want to switch back out. So we're saying really to the first day of school, they can do that. But we, we would prefer that, you know, we've got to schedule these kids. We've got to make sure all that's planned. So um, in talking with Mr. McMillan, we can, we're going to extend it through the summer. Um, so we hope, we hope, and remember we have to change in high school, you're changing kids out of cohorts into different cohorts. So there's a lot of things that, that go on. So um, uh, hopefully through the scheduling process, we will be able to have even deeper conversations with those families. Yeah, thank you for that question. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, if you could go to the next screen and if you have other questions as you, as you process through this, uh, we can always go back. So this is the, uh, su the supplemental year assurances that Katie has asked us to look at in a nutshell. I, I mean, you, you you received this, I believe in your packet, but for our community, it's really what we are obligated and will do because it's the right thing to do. Um, we'll make sure that the kids that do take the supplemental year will have to t also participate in the in the assessment, state required assessments. We're going to make sure that our home McKinney Vendo homeless kiddos, our special ed kiddos, our GTEL students will still continue to receive the services that they're obligated to. And that's pretty much what a lot of these uh, assurances refer back to. Um, and and I put it in a, in a nutshell, it's doing the right thing by the child for what, what we stand here to do. So that's really what these assurances are for. Some of it is logistical things that we're going to mark them appropriately in infant campus, which we will do that as well. And if you could go to the next screen, please. And this is just a continuum of the, of the assurances. Um, one of the key points, which I, is that we, we would never retain a child without consulting a parent. And, I, and that's, that's a, I think, a given. And public school today, but it's still one of those things I think is to st be stated that we'll agree on. So what we will do, depending on what you, your vote is tonight, we will we will respond to this and, and upload this into to KDE uh, with the board approval date, if that's what you so, so choose to do. Um, so on the next screen, I think what we're, we're recommending for us, but this is again, that we can approve this supplemental year request established by Senate Bill 128 and the SCPS district assurance is required by KDE. Uh, but I will let you certainly make that decision and um, and can answer any questions that you might have. Any questions from board members? I just wanna share Go appreciation ahead. for the work that the, the intentional work that you all did, as you mentioned during this extremely busy time of year um, to really meet with every single family that signed up to figure out if this was the right program for them or not. 
Um, so that intentionality and that extra workload, I just really appreciate that. I know the families, I've heard from the families, they appreciate these individual conversations that you all have had. So I just want to say thank you to everyone involved with that. And thank you. I'd like to echo that. That's our principals are awesome and they, they are teachers and our counseling staff and they're juggling so many things. I almost felt guilty when I sent out requests, uh, but they, they do a great job and I really appreciate their timely responses. So thank you for that. And to that point, I think one of the things to note while, you know, as you acknowledge the, the requirement is that we approve or accept or approve or reject blanketly that our schools have been engaged in intentional conversations directly with families, that um, there, there has been contact, that we've walked families through the various options, uh, especially in terms of academics, and um, ensuring that families make an informed decision um, in, in this regard if this is something that is approved. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from board members? There are no further questions in. A motion is in order to approve the supplemental year program and district assurances established under the enactment of Senate Bill 128. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the supplemental year program and district assurances established under the enactment of Senate Bill 128. A motion by Board Member Morris. Is there a second? Second. A second by board member Spires. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries five, zero. Thank you, thank you very you. much to the team. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you, board. And thank you, Mr. Hill. We appreciate all of your efforts uh, in this regard. Uh, we are next seeking your approval of an addendum to our contract with uh, the Lexington Fayette County Health Department to provide uh, nursing services during our summer Ignite program. Uh, we discussed this matter during our planning work session on May 10th, but Health Services Coordinator Debbie Bowen is available if you have any additional questions. Any questions for Ms. Bowen? If there are no further questions, the motion is in order to approve the contract addendum number three to the contract with the Lexington Fayette County Health Department for additional school nurse summer hours at a total cost of $92,623.48. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. A motion by Board Member Green. Is there a second? Second. A second by Board Member Spires. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? on the contract addendum for school nurse summer hours. Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Dr. Hill. Thank you, board. Our next item for your consideration is a contract to continue providing our students with the very popular Imagine Learning platform. Uh, you heard from Title I coordinator, Mindy Mills, about this initiative during our work session on May 10th, but she is available this evening if you have any additional questions. Any questions for Ms. Mills? If there are no further questions, a motion is in order to approve the contract with Imagine Learning for the 2021-2022 school year. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the contract with Imagine Learning for the 2021-22 school year. A motion by board member Spires. Is there a second? Second. A second by board member Green. We have a motion and a second. Um, any discussion on the Imagine Learning contract? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, board. Um, our next item is we are asking you to approve a contract renewal for our third party claims administration for liability claims. Uh, during our work session again on May 10th, you had the opportunity to discuss this item with our director of risk management, uh, safety and security, 
Joe Isaacs, but he is here again this evening if you have any additional or new questions. Any questions, board members? If there are no further questions, the motion is in order to approve the contract renewal for underwriter safety and claims, our third party claims administrator for liability claims. I will make a motion for the contract renewal for the underwriter safety and claims, our third writer party claims administrator for liability claims. Motion by board member Green. Is there a second? Second. Second by board member Spires. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on the underwriter safety and claims? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, board. And tonight we bring you uh, for the second reading of an update to board policy 08.221 which we also discussed during our planning work session on May 10th. Uh, Chief of Middle Schools, Tracy Bruno, is available if you have any additional questions about that particular policy. Any questions, board members? Hearing none, a motion is in order for the FCPS secondary schools to move to a 10-point grading scale and for the middle schools to have the flexibility whether to use the specified conduct grades is as was presented at the work session. Is there a motion to that effect? I will make a motion to amend the grading scale. And I just want to say as a quick note, I think this is a great thing for our students and the great. So I'm enthusiastically making this motion. Excellent. We have an enthusiastic motion by board member Spires. Is there an enthusiastic second? Second. Okay. Well, we'll okay, give it give to Ms. Morris. Morris since, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, second by board member Morris. We have a motion to second. Uh, any discussion on this motion? Then I will echo that. Uh, you know, this has been a conversation uh, that we've had uh, just to bring some parity uh, across the district. So, Mr. Bruno, thank you to you and your team uh, for bringing this to us. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, board. Uh, the next two items are uh, for your consideration. An action this evening is uh, the approval of a job description that is a revised job description. It's not a it's not a new job, but just a revised job description that better matches uh, the role that we are asking uh, the employee to um, assume. So the first one is a safe crisis and social emotional learning management specialist. Uh, there is no budgetary impact and uh, human resources director Jennifer Dyer did uh, provide you some information at the May 10th meeting, but she is available this evening if you have any additional questions. Any questions for Ms. Dyer? Hearing none, a motion is in order to approve the job description of District Safe Crisis and Social Emotional Learning Management Specialist. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the job description for the social emotional, a long name. Okay. <laughs> Learning <laughs> Management Specialist. Learning Management Specialist. Excellent motion by board member Spires. Is there a second? Second. I'll second. Give it to I'll Jones. Give that one, I'll give that to Ms. <laughs> board member Jones. Second by board member Jones. Motion by board member Spires. Second by board member Jones. Any discussion on the job description approval? Hearing none, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, board. Next, we are seeking your approval of a job description. Uh, again, this is uh, not a new job, but just a new job description for a district mental health coordinator. And once again, our human resources director, Jennifer Dyer, is available if you have additional questions. Any questions for Ms. Dyer? If there are no further questions, a motion is in order to approve the job description 
of District Mental Health Coordinator. I moved. A motion by board member Spires. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by board member Jones. Motion by board member Spires, second by board member Jones. Any discussion on the approval of the district mental health coordinator job description? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, board. Our next three items all fall in the area of budget and financial planning. So rather than walking through each of them, um, I'm going to ask the Director of Budget and Financial Planning and Samson Grimes to address each of them uh, with you uh, prior to your taking action. You will need to vote on each matter separately. So we will start with the revised salary schedule for 2021. Thanks, Dr. Helm. Good evening, board members. Good evening, community. Um, we're making a proposal to amend the salary schedule for the current year. That's the first item for consideration. And the only change was uh, that special ed services are needed during the summer, and those will be paid from IDEA B uh, funding, as well as district technology services, just like Dr. Helm spoke about earlier with the uh, reconditioning of the Chromebooks. So that's the first item for the board's consideration. Are there any questions about the revised salary schedule? A motion is in order to approve the 2020-2021 added stipend rate for district summer special education and technology services. Is there a motion? So moved. Motion by board member Green. Is there a second? Second. Second by board member Spires. Uh, any discussion on the revised salary schedule? Hearing none, the motion is on the revised salary schedule. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. So the next item is the FY22 tentative budget for the board's consideration. And I'll turn it over to Ms. Inako for introduction. Next slide, please. So the whole purpose of education is to turn mirrors into windows. Uh, this is a fantastic quote and drives our processes in my department where we're crafting the budget to help support our students and staff throughout the district. Next slide, please. Um, the board knows that we uh, make every effort all day to support our students and our staff and students come first. Victory is in the classroom. Um, leadership, capacity, and accountability and collaboration are the keys for our success. Families are always our partners, and we work hard to maintain and support them as well, along with our community relationships. Next slide, please. Ms. Co. You know, you're, you're muted. You're muted. Sorry, I was, <laughs> um, there's something wrong with the mouse on my computer and I couldn't, I couldn't get unmuted. Um, the um, state bed, um, mandated budget timeline is something that we have absolutely no control over um, in the school district. These are all things that are either, um, well, they're all statutory. Um, I know sometimes the budget timeline doesn't make great sense um, because we approve our final working budget after the school year has already begun, but this is, um, this is the way it is written into law and we just, all school districts adhere to this timeline. And what we'll be asking you to do tonight is to approve the tentative budget. Um, and it's something that we'll continue, to, um, we'll continue to work on throughout the next few months and bring something to you in September for final approval. 
Next slide, please. This is a presentation of how the budget has been allocated. Um, projected expenditures that we have for next year, 60% are roughly instruction. Contingency, 6.5% fund transfers, a smaller portion, and the smaller elements that help support the district student transportation at 4%. Our plant operations and maintenance to maintain our buildings and ensure that our students and staff have the facilities to be able to learn and stay safe. Business support, um, we work as a team to make sure that everyone has what they need across the district. And then the school admin, um, instructional staff support and student support are components of instruction as well. Next slide, please. This is a summary of the projected revenues. This is based on the budget and the percentages that we anticipate the um, general fund will be supported from local tax revenue, state revenue, the fund balance itself and other receipts. Next slide, please. As the board can see, um, we always strive to increase the amount of funding that we put towards instruction. And we have estimated a salaries fund forecast at 92% for our instructional staff and roughly 8% for our operational staff. Next slide, please. This is the total projected revenue by fund. This is looking at um, all of our funding sources holistically. Typically the special revenue fund, it houses our grants and it's usually much smaller. However, um, given the recent funding that we've received for ESSER, this is contained within the special revenue fund. So it's slightly larger for our projection for next year. Next slide, please. And this is the board approved staffing, staffing allocation formula. Um, it, it, it is considered um, very, uh, uh, pretty generous compared to other school districts. Um, I, I will point out, because I, I know you get questions from time to time about class sizes, that the school-based decision-making council can change these ratios. This is only um, a formula that we use to allocate the money to the schools. Uh, once it gets allocated, then the SPDM councils make the determination about um, how, to, how to staff their school. It, and it's not unusual at all um, to find classrooms larger than those that you see stated on this page. But again, it's, it's a council decision. Next slide, please. This shows our projected staffing levels for each of our levels within the district for elementary, middle, high, technical centers, and other academic programs. The cost that is listed on this slide is for the teachers that you see based on the previous staffing allocation slide that shows the breakdown for each grade. These costs include a 2% salary increase. Next slide, please. This is for the board's consideration this evening to select the uh, optional workday or flex day for teachers. The cost for this one non-instructional day to the district is roughly 1 million. The flex day becomes part of the work calendar, whereas the optional work day does not. Um, these have similar um, pros, but the cons between the two, um, one as a flex day could remain a permanent cost to the district, whereas the other, the board can select um, based on available budgeting each year as far as the optional work day. Next slide, please. This is the uh, seller schedule impact. This is also for the board's consideration this evening to select either no change to the salary schedule, a 1% increase and a 2% increase. Next slide, please. This is a summary of the items that we discussed. I'll turn it over to Ms. Coe. Um, we'll be going through each of these items, but I first want to turn it over to Rodney Jackson to talk to you a little bit about um, the um, indirect costs that are included in the budget. So if you look at the right side of the screen, you will see estimated ESSER indirect costs. At CASBO, which stands for Kentucky Social and School Business Officials Conference, KDE notified hundreds of finance and business officials that the conference that good news has occurred and unrestricted rate could be taken for all the ESSER or CARE funds. Um, although we was notified before May 10th, I waited till we got some official in writing. That's why we did not talk about it at the planning meeting. We got some in writing on May 12th saying that this rate could be utilized. We need to emphasize the importance of maximizing indirect cost rate 
because it generates dollars for the general fund as it doesn't spend against the grant. It's also not subject to matrix restrictions and is important for accurate reporting. It assists in sustainability and it's consistently Fayette County, we've always applied this rate when we can allow it. To not do so could have greater implications. And we appreciate being notified of this and being able to take advantage of this opportunity. Kind of make over to Kena. Man. Back to Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Thank you, Ms. Cow. Um, this is a summary of the general fund expenditures broken down by the projected one year expenditures and the continuing expenditures that we anticipate for the next several years. And just uh, highlight the Carter G. Woodson Preparatory Academy. The, this expenditure will continue, but as the program expands, but the amount will change as we continue to add grades. This estimate is for K through two. The rise stem is the same. So this expansion will change as the program expands as well. Um, this is the addition of the third grade expansion. The um, additional non-instructional day is on here as well as a projected one year expenditure. It's at the board's discretion whether to continue this for um, subsequent years in the future. The amended for your classification experience requirement has been included since that will be an impact to next year's budget. The CERS increase is an unavoidable cost along with insurance, portable classrooms, and the interpreting contract services to meet federal mandates. The salary inc increase at 2% is included on here as well. And as a district, we always work to increase okay. our savings and our reduction in costs. So the board uh, will see that we have reduced the, um, the impact to the lease at BCTC in order to capture those savings. And then these are projected revenues. Um, these are only projections. We're in a tentative phase, and this will change as we know more about our, our assessments in the fall. So um, these are merely estimates, and I've included um, the estimated property tax as well as increase in fund balance. And the estimated seek increase also includes a funded full day kindergarten. But as the board knows in the um, legislative session this year, that was only for one year. And as Mr. Jackson spoke about earlier, this is the ESSER indirect cost, and it could fluctuate as well. For a total projected surplus of $13 million. Next slide, please. The highlight for the ESSER 1 spending for the CARES Act that will end in 2022. Um, SCPS received uh, roughly 11 million, but a portion of this had to be allocated to the private school. There was an equity services component with just with ESSER 1 and FCPS allocated roughly 10.7 million in each of these categories for instruction, technology, sanitation, transportation, and of course, indirect costs. Next slide, please. For ESSER 2, um, this was a separate act, a new act, and FCPS rece will receive, this is on a reimbursement basis, all ESSER funding is on a reimbursement basis based on um, expenditures that are allowable for these grants, roughly $45 million. And these were allocated to food service, which is considered a direct service in our various programs that we have, um, as well as school allocation to maximize their resources. There are a few items that are COVID related uh, in the indirect service component, and those will be costs that are allocated to ESSER 2 as well. Next slide, please. ESSER 3 is the latest, which has now been, uh, the name has now been changed to ARP ESSER, it's the ARPA Act. This grant will end on 2024. Um, we just received a recent allocation of 101 million. And these are a few items that are currently known. So the school's uh, secondary allocation will come out of this ARPA Act funding as well as Chromebooks and hotspots. And then the indirect cost that the board saw on the summary slide is prorated for fiscal year 22. So we have to receive additional information on this funding as well as uh, the requirements from KDE. Next slide, please. This is the summary for the tentative budget that the board has reviewed. The local and state revenue sources roughly total 598 million. A safety tax is contained within this. The board is approving safety tax and uh, later that information will come to the board. The budget will increase with the property tax growth as well. Special revenue, this includes the ESSER funding as prorated for what will be allocated to fiscal year 22. Uh, food service is a self-sustaining fund um, and then capital outlay is funded at $100 per ADA as required by the seat formula. 
the building fund is a direct connect to our um, amortization schedule for our bond obligations for the district for roughly a budget of 821 million. Thank you all. Thank you. Are, are there any questions, board members of our budget team? And again, this is a product of, you know, our budget work sessions and our work, our um, planning session as well as um, uh, uh, any other questions for? I do have one quick question. Mm -hmm. So is summer ignite 22 to 20, like next summer, is that a guarantee expense this time? Because, or is that a tentative expense? Because I know we were going to evaluate after this summer. I didn't, I'm, I didn't know that was a definite thing. So I just want to get yeah. it. It's just a placeholder okay. and we will evaluate it after, uh, at the end of this summer's program. Thank you. Any other questions, board members? Okay. If there are no further questions, the motion is in order to approve the Fayette County Public Schools 2020-2021 tentative budget and instruct the superintendent to submit the tentative budget to the Kentucky Department of Education. Is there a motion? I'll oh, make oh. a motion to approve the 2021-22 tentative budget. Is that what it is? Did this I is say 2020-21. 20, yes, that's correct. 2021, 2022. Yes, I will make it. It's hard to believe we're up on 2022. <laughs> yes, I will make that motion to approve 21, 22. Thank you, Board Member Spires. Is there a second? Well, I, I have a question uh, before we go on. By approving the tentative budget, are we approving the flexible work day or the optional work day? Where, where is that in our decision making tonight right action on that you are um, you were muted on the first part of your answer do you mind to repeat that i'm sorry i, I think you need a separate action on that yes i, I dr helmet is coming up is that correct uh i'm sorry i you've lost me uh the the tentative budget includes a if I'm not mistaken, it includes an optional work day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The optional work day has been included, encapsulated within the budget. Yeah. Yes. If you if you look at the page that has general fund expenditures, it says additional non-instructional day, one optional work day. Um, I think based on our uh, review the optional is what we were recommending so optional versus flex just based on the needs um, Mr. Jones so I don't know that we need a separate um, decision because it's okay. on that page and it's part of the um, it's part of the tentative budget okay as long as that's understood then I'll second the motion thank you uh, we have a Motion by Board Member Spire and a second by Board Member Jones. Is there any discussion on the tentative budget? Okay. Hearing none, uh, the question is on the approval of the tentative budget. All in favor say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. And I'm hearing from Ms. Chatfield that our previous guest speaker sh uh, should be uh, have the technology issues resolved. So we're going to pause here and give them an opportunity um, to speak. Ms. Jones, can you let him in from the, wait, the waiting room? Connecting now. And Thank that you. was Mr. Waldner, right? Stuart Waldner. Yes. Right. Can you hear me at this time? Yes, sir. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you so much. So sorry about that. Um, my name is Stuart Waldner. I'm not an employee of Fayette County Public Schools. I'm here to talk about school safety. Security resource officers in Fayette County schools unduly target students of color and students with disabilities, which in turn traumatizes students and fuels the school to prison pipeline. 
In the 2019-2020 school year, 62% of incidents involving school police, 86% of arrests, and 92% of percent of charges were among black students, even though black students made up only 23% of the student population. These experiences have a profoundly negative effect on a child's life. School safety is something we all want, but studies indicate that police presence in schools does nothing to deter school violence. What does work is having trusted adults, such as counselors, mental health professionals, and teachers whom students feel they can confide in. Asking any student, but especially students of color, to confide in police is not the solution. The school board needs to replace the 2018 comprehensive 10 point safety investment plan. Continuing to use it, especially in light of the national reckoning over race that was sparked by the police murders of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and sadly so many others puts you the school board out of step, not only with the students you are here to serve, but also the rest of the country. As a taxpayer and business owner in Fayette County, I am deeply concerned that my tax dollars are not being spent on what has been proven to be the most effective way for ending school violence. In fact, millions of tax dollars are being spent on harsh policing, which negatively affecting so many of our, the children in our schools. Members of the board, do you want to be part of the problem or solution? Do you want to uphold a system we know regularly traumatizes and criminalizes students? As a citizen, I'm counting on you to change your legacy by reducing the number of police at each high school and limit their role to emergencies only, and by increasing the number of full-time mental health professionals in each school. Doing so will create a more just and equitable school system for all our students. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Mr. Walden. We were glad we got your technology straightened out there. Thank you. And at this time, Dr. Helm, I'll turn the agenda back over to you. Um, I think we still have the salary schedule for 21-22. Ms. Grimes, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Helm. So the board um, has received a copy of the fiscal year 22 salary schedule and contained within that copy is the no change 1% and 2% salary increase. For the board's consideration, um, a selection will need to be made uh, for each of those, whether they want to take action on either no change 1% or 2%. There are a few other changes within the salary schedule. So if there are any other questions, let me know, um, and I'm happy to address those. Well, uh, don't we need to act on the 2021 revised salary schedule? Uh, that was the previous item. You've already done that. Yeah, That's we did that before it. the tentative budget. Okay. okay, all right, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, are we looking for a motion on the salary schedule, Mr. Murphy? Yes. So, yes. Uh, Ms. Uh, Sampson Grimes, you need a motion that indicates the the level. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so I, I will make, go ahead, Mr. Jones. I would, Jones. I would like to make the motion that uh, that we adopt a two percent salary increase for all board employees for the twenty one twenty two school year. Is, that is there a, is there a motion? motion? Yes, that's good. Okay. Second. Is there a second? Who was the second on that? Uh, Ms. Uh, board Member Morris. So we have a motion by Board Member Jones and a second by Board Member Mor uh, Morris to approve the 2021-2022 salary <laughs> schedule <laughs> with, with a 2% with the 2% option for the teacher salary schedule, occupational therapist, physical therapist, Law Enforcement Lieutenant Salary Schedule, Family Resource and Youth Service Center Coordinator Salary Schedule, and Classified Hourly Employees Single Salary Schedule, and approve the 21-22 Scout Salary Schedules as presented for the following. Certified Salary Schedule Index, the Supplemental Salary Schedule for Academics, the Supplemental Salary Schedule for Athletics, the Administrative Additive Schedule for Administrative and Supervisory Personnel, and the substitute teacher salary schedule and student workers salary schedule. That 
is the motion board member Jones and board member Morris, does that actually reflect your motions? That, that accurately reflects the motion that I wanted to make, but before we vote on it, I think that the community needs to understand that the uh, Fayette County employees, you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, uh, Dr. Helm, have not had a salary increase in three years. Is that correct? I believe that is correct. I wasn't here, but I believe that is okay. correct. It may have even been longer. Was it just three years? Five. Five uh, years. Last five okay. years, yes. Okay, so I uh, want the community to know that we are taking this action uh, for a lot of reasons, but one of the biggest ones is that there has not been a salary increase for five years. Any other discussion on the motion? And I know one thing that was noted in our work sessions was um, the uh, maintaining competitive, uh, being competitive with other districts who are also taking some similar actions as well. Um, but if there is no further discussion well, on this. I just want to throw in too, I mean, I think at the end of the day, and we all have said this many times, but we need to thank our employees. Um, this year has been incredibly difficult. And all of our employees have gone above and beyond. Um, I mean, we heard earlier 36,000 home visits. Um, we have teachers teaching on Zoom and teaching in person. Um, you know, I heard from teachers last week who were trying to teach and watch their own children um, go through their promotion ceremonies. And you know, we've just really, um, our bus drivers, our custodians, everyone has really gone above and beyond this year. And, so um, I think Mr. Jones makes a great point as well. You know, we've not been able to do this for a few years. And so even though we know that um, economic times are tough and our community is still in recovery, we want to invest in our staff and we want to know that, that we support them. And so thank you for your service. Very well stated, uh, Ms. Fires. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Board Member Spires. Thank you, Board Member Jones. Any other discussion? And thank you to our employees to echo what Board Member Spires said. Absolutely. And uh, hearing no further discussion, we have a motion and a second to approve the salary schedule with the 2% increase. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Thank you, board members. Thank you for recognizing the excellence uh, of all of our staff and for um, taking this action. It will uh, mean a great deal to each and every uh, member of the Fayette County Public Schools family. So thank you. Um, the next item, as we look ahead to the upcoming school year, we are seeking your approval of the updated student code of conduct for the 21-22 school year. The annual revision process of the Code of Conduct is done uh, with participation from a very diverse group of stakeholders. And during our last meeting on May 10th, you had a robust discussion with uh, PBIS coach Dee Dee Newburn, who takes uh, the lead in making sure that the Code of Conduct is uh, updated on a regular basis and she pretty much knows it inside out. So she is with us again this evening if you have any, any questions, but uh, this is our next action item. Any questions, board members? I make the motion that the revisions to the student, student code of conduct be adopted. We have a motion by board member Jones. Is there a second? A second. A second by board member Green. Any discussion? All in favor of approving the code of conduct for the 21-22 school year, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Are any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, board members. Our next agenda item is related to the annual offer of state funding through the Kentucky Education Technology System. So at this time, I will uh, turn it over to our technology gurus to talk a little bit about uh, this, since this was not something that I believe we talked about um, at the May 10th meeting. 
Good evening, board. I just want to give just a quick overview of the CATS offer of assistance. This was not included in the May 10th meeting because we didn't receive the offer from um, the School Facilities Construction Commission and KDE until May 14th. And so we bring this to you. This is an annual um, process that we go through in order to approve these funds. There is no impact to the budget. Um, even though we do match these funds, we are able to use technology salaries primarily to do that match. And so there's no budget impact. Um, at least not a negative budget impact, just a positive one. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. That's the type of impact we like to hear about. Uh, uh, any questions, board members? If there are no further questions, a motion is in order to approve the fiscal year 21 KETS offer of assistance in the amount of $773,547. Is there a motion? So moved. A motion by board member Spires. Is there a second? Second. A second by board member Morris. We have a motion, a second. Any discussion on approval of the CATS offer of assistance? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, board. It, it's always good to be able to accept money instead of having to <laughs> give it away. Uh, our last two uh, agenda items for your consideration this evening are the tentative budget for the school activity fund and our monthly financial report. So I will ask financial accounting and benefit service director Rodney Jackson to share more and we will go from there. Mr. Jackson. Thank you. Good evening. Um, before we get into the monthly finance report, similar to the tentative budget that you just approved, the school activity funds have to submit their budgets to us. They have a separate bank account that they use a secondary bank account that they manage through EPS, which is outside of Munis. And before you have the budgets that they've submitted, we did not receive their budgets till after May 10th. And that's why you're just now seeing that, but we're required to get this approved also before May 31st. Are there any questions or concerns about school activity fund budgets? Any questions, board members? If there are no further questions, the motion is in order to approve the tentative school activity fund budgets as presented. We'll make a motion to approve the tentative school activity fund budgets as presented. A motion by board member Green. Is there a second? Second. Second by board member Spires. Any discussion? Hearing none, we have a motion and a second for approval of the tentative school activity fund budgets. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thanks, Amy. Can you pull up the monthly report? As you can see, the general fund review for the monthly report as of April 30th, 2021, reflects that our fund balance is 100, approximately 135 million as indicated by the blue arrow. I will go into detail about revenue and expenditures on the following slides. Next slide, please. If you can see a comparison of 2021 fiscal year versus 2020 fiscal year, you can see we have approximately $20 million more in the general fund and the income is 6.4 versus 7.5 million comparing both years. Next slide, please. All funds, this is funds one, general fund all the way through 7,000 trust funds reflects revenues of 662.5 million versus expenditures of 453.8 million an overall net fund balance of 208.57 million, excuse me. Next slide, please. This indicates all funds, fund one, column all the way through fund 7,000. You will notice that we're in a negative on fund 310, which is capital outlay. This is related to a delayed journal entry that we have to do related to moving funds to the beginning balance that just occurred this morning. And then on fund 51 is food service. You can see we're in the whole 104,000. This is related to the impact of COVID and we've worked out a plan to take care of this for fund balance for food services. As you're aware, any fund is in a negative at the end of the year has to be handled by general fund. And I'm excited to tell you there will be no fund that's in a negative and general fund will not have to cover anything. And you can see at the bottom indicated by the red arrow, $208.7 million ties to the previous slide. Next slide, please. This is the revenue analysis 
which reflects 410 million this year versus 418.5 million last year. Again, one more detail on the latest slide, but as you can see we're $8.5 million less in revenue this year compared to last year, including beginning balance. Next slide. If you take out the beginning balance for both years, you will see we only $1 million difference as this year is $346 million versus $347 million last year. Next slide, please. Total expenditures were $275 million versus $303.4 million in expenditures last year. Next slide, please. Okay, let's go into more details that I was talking about. So as you can see on this slide, if you look at the first one, it says property taxes. This shows that a percentage realized is 98% versus 100% last year at this time. We we're approximately $1 million less than the previous year. And at this rate, unpredictable, we will not make budget in this area. You also know the occupational license tax were 88% versus 60% and we're about $5.4 million more. Um, and although Lexington is not recession proof, it has been recession resistant in a lot of ways related to this and COVID. We did not expect this to happen when COVID hit and I'm very pleased the occupational license tax are coming in at a higher rate and we expect to exceed budget. As you can see, utilities and motor vehicles, both are experiencing at this point Revenue is higher than budgeted. Overall, we're $8.5 million less, and that's primarily due to a $7.5 million decrease in fund balance that happened last year. Next slide, please. On the expenditure side, you will know the total salaries and fringes are $4 million less than the previous year. This is primarily because subs were not utilized as much as they were using previous year because of COVID, because we were not actually in the classroom, but doing virtual for most of the year. Vendor payments are approximately $10 million less. This is because a lot of the expenses are in fund two grants versus in a general fund and 14.5 million related to fund transfers related to the building that we're new central office building that we bought. Overall, our expenses are $28.5 million less than the previous year. Next slide, please. This is our investment schedule, which reflects the investments we have made and type of investments and maturity date and cost and the interest that we would get through June 30th. Next slide, please. The balance sheet reflects total assets of 142.3 million. The balance sheet also reflects total liability 7.3 million. Our financial position remains sound in relation to assets versus liability. Our encumbrances are approximately 6.4 million. If all these becomes become reality, our fund balance would drop 6.4 million or approximately $128.5 million. Next slide, please. Our trust funds, Marcy Thomason, probably 268,000, Dorothy Smith, 19,000, John Smith, John Price, excuse me, 40,000. Our other trust funds have been sound Center, Bluegrass Community Foundation, and received. Are there any questions or concerns? Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Are there any questions? If there are no further questions, a motion is in order to accept the monthly treasurer's report of revenue expense reports as presented to the board. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to accept the monthly financial reports. A motion by board member Spires. Is there a second? Second. A second by board member Jones. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on the treasurer's report? All in favor of approving the report, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thank you, board. Our agenda this evening also includes the uh, informational items as, uh, t as usual. That includes the school activity fund report, the personnel changes, budget transfer report, and the position control document. At this time, I will turn the meeting back over to our chairman, Chair Murphy and also mention that we do not have a need to go into closed session this evening. Thank you, Dr. Helm. At this time, a motion is in order to make the agenda dated May 24th, 2021, on which action has been taken at this meeting, a part of the minutes as if copied in the minutes verbatim. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. A motion by Board Member Morris. Is there a second? Second. Second by Board Member Green. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any, any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Okay. Is there anything else for the good of the board? Um, I have a quick comment 
um, if it's okay with the board chair. Um, in January, I brought up with you all um, that we, um, to recognize, I think, let me back up for a second. Recognizing that we are an all white board, acknowledging what what is, it is what it is. Um, and, um, sorry. And my colleagues, you all engaged um, and we agreed to commit to diversity, equity and inclusivity training within the first 30 days. And we did that as a board team. And then we also have done some individual training as well. And I think I can speak for all of us when I say we recognize that we need more diversity and that we represent a diverse population and that you know, we really as a community need to address some systemic issues in our community that led to, to a decrease in representation on this board. But in the meantime, I think we are all committed to working with our colleagues and community partners that work in these communities and really engaging them through the process. But we also committed to, until this board changes that demographic, we are gonna continue to work on ourselves and work on engaging the community and work on, um, on, on our personal our personal selves as well. And so what I want to bring forward to you all, we've kind of paused a little bit because we've been doing the superintendent search and I don't really have any action items tonight or anything, but I wanted us as a board to maybe take away from this. What do we want to do next? Do we want to engage and do listening tours? Do we want to do additional training as a board team? Where do we want to go? And so I just wanted to kind of bring that forward um, to my colleagues, but also I really wanted to make the community aware that this is something we committed to yeah. and that we are actively doing the work both internally and as a group and that we are, um, we recognize that we um, lack diversity in some areas and that we want to engage the community. So I really just wanted to toss that out to you all tonight to kind of be thinking is hopefully we'll get a superintendent in here soon. So what are the next steps for us as a board? So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, board member Spires. And I, I echo those comments. Um, we, it, it can't just be something that we, you know, we attend a training and then we move on, right? It has to be ongoing work. And I think all of us are committed to that. And that needs to be a, an important part of the conversation. And um, that's something we can look at opportunities available to do just that. A great opportunity to, to partner with our incoming uh, superintendent as, as well and, and share in that work. Thank you. Any other comments, board members? Hearing none, I will entertain a motion to adjourn this meeting of the Fayette County Board of Education. Submit. Motion by board member Spires. Is there a second? Okay. Second by board member Green. All in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. We are now adjourned. And we encourage everyone to go out to uh, those community forums this week and our meet and greet next week and submit those public comments to us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, board.